I'm Becky Mayer, and welcome to Transitions, Body, Mind, Spirit. You know how transitions are. We change from one thing to another to another. And oftentimes I refer to triathlons, which is something that I do. You swim, and then you bike, and then you run, and you have transitions. Well, your body can have transitions. Your life can have transitions sexually. And this is part two with our guest, sexual health advocate, expert, Ginger Manley, who is here today. Thank you, Ginger, Thank for you, being Becky. here. Thank you. And I again want to say all the wonderful things that uh, Ginger is, there's such a long list of things, I'm gonna say it one more time. She is a nurse psychotherapist and a sex therapist who has over 30 years experience practicing and teaching in the field of sexual health. Her specialties have include sexual addiction, trauma, sexual dysfunction, and she retired from private practice in 2005 and presently in, is an associate in the Department of Psychiatry at Vanderbilt University, working with Vanderbilt Comprehensive Assessment Program. And she has a new book out called Assisted Loving, The Journey Through Sexuality and Aging. So this is part two. We had a, a, we could probably have part five and 10 and everything, there's such a rich subject. And what I'd like to do today on this program is kind of talk about the aging process for males and for females in a sexual manner. And let's talk about the men first, males, when they start to be 40 or 50, what happens to them? And does that mean they don't have an erection like that or don't have orgasm four times like in your, your 20s? Or tell us about that. Well, we're aging, all of our life we're aging. And so uh, some of the things that happen are just normal products of aging and some of them are not. Um, typically what happens is that most men by the time they're in their 40s or for sure by the time they're in their 50s have had at least one episode where they either couldn't get an erection or they couldn't keep an erection. And we call that, we used to call that impotence. We now call that ED or erectile dysfunction. But mm. truly that's not so much a dysfunction, that's just kind of a normal thing that happens. But what happens in a guy's head is even more importantly because most guys, their erection is so tied to their manhood, their manliness, that the first time that he can't get or keep an erection as long as he wants to, it's like, I'm over, this is gone. The, the best characterization of that was in the movie MASH when you saw they actually had a funeral because the guy had lost his ability to have erections and so they put him in a casket and, and all of that. Um, it's not quite that dramatic for most people, but it does happen. Now, that's not the kind of thing that happens from so much from a physical standpoint as that's probably more anxiety, that's probably just, just being tired, whatever. But typically as a man ages on into his 60s and then certainly on into his 70s and 80s, the mm -hmm. body begins to slow down. It takes several things working in the body in order to get an erection. It takes blood supply, it takes nerve supply, and it takes muscle, and it takes testosterone. And all of those things change over time. And so by the time mm -hmm most men are into their late 70s then and certainly into their 80s it gets more difficult to be able to have an erection the good news is that a lot of men many men in their 60s and and actually the majority of men in their early 70s are still able to get really good erections most of the time and keep those for as long as they want to hmm. so 30 percent or so of men in their, in their late 60s, early 70s, 50% in their late 70s, maybe more like 70 to 80%. But I talk to men in their late 80s, some in their 90s, who everything's just working great. And they're, in their 90s? And their partners confirm it. You know, guys lie sometimes, so you have to say, so what does she, he, she say, or what does your mate say, or your partner say? And they say, 
It works for me. It works. It works. So, wow. so that would be more unusual in the late 80s and 90s, but there are people who who've, that's true for. For women, um, I, I think the changes are sort of more tied to the, to the hormonal cycle that has to do with menopause. Mm -hmm. And we know now that menopause is not something that just happens. We used to say, well, menopause, the typical age is 52, and there's all this that happens before, and then there's this that happens afterwards. What mm -hmm. we understand now is that for most women, there's a 10-year period that, mm -hmm. um, that we call perimenopause, about five or six years before menopause and then two or three years after that kind of constitute that period of time. Mm -hmm. And women's bodies change during that period of time. There's not as much hormone production. There's not, there's uh, many things change. And the typical first thing that a woman notices is that she doesn't get as wet as she used to. So getting wet is equivalent to having an erection for a man. It's the same physical process that happens. And the first thing is in her 40s or 50s, she begins to notice she's aroused, she's feeling turned on, but she's just not getting wet anymore. And um, a lot of times women don't think about that as a part of, of just the normal process of aging. Mm. But within a coupleship, somebody might, the other person might say, you're not being turned on anymore. Well, yeah, I'm feeling turned on, I'm just not getting wet. And over time, the changes are not quite as obvious as they are in a man because a woman's erection doesn't mm. show on the outside. Women get erections. All women get erections. Many women are not aware of their erections. They can't be seen, but they can be felt if a woman is, is alert to the signs of that and not mm. getting wet is one of those signs. Um, but women don't have kind of the, the same pressure to be, um, there's no pressure to get erections like there is for men because women are more in the receptive rather than the giving side of um, penis and vagina intercourse anyway. Um, so we, what we see over time is changes that take place, um, not necessarily all related to body functions, but many times related, related to states of health, related to medications, related to surgery, mm. um, related to how the person is feeling and how the relationship is going. So mm -hmm. lots of changes that take place. Mm -hmm. And um, some need to be treated uh, medically and some need to be treated with talk and some just need a girlfriend who's got a lot of information. That's what I, the role that I have filled. You cannot believe the numbers of people who stop me and say, hey, what about this? And then they tell me their story. Ah. And um, so when I play golf, when I, when I'm, <laughs> when you know, play in golf, when I'm playing hey, golf. Hey, let me but, ask you about that's this. Right. People, will, they know what I do and they say, I have this friend. Well, it's not always the friend who's having the problem. Usually it's the person. And um, so I hear a lot of stories like that, that people just need information. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote the book. I mm -hmm. want people to have information in hand. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the, the lubricating part of a woman which t tends to uh, get less and less as they age. Mm -hmm. And you also put in your book these uh, different oils. What are the different oils that you talked about? I tell about? you, when I was young and I would hear my older mentors say, the joy of sex in old age, older age is using oils and I went, I don't need any oils, things are just fine, thank you. But let me tell you, there is great joy in using body oils. And many people have discovered that in terms of doing sensuous massages anyway. Mm -hmm. But most of us as we age can really benefit from having some good lubrication. And, and you heard me one time in a previous lecture say, just like a realtor says, location, location, location. It is about lubrication, lubrication, lubrication. Um, but we, we can really enjoy lubrication, men and women both. Um, and typically we have in our pantry all that we need. We, now there are specialty things that you can buy that cost a whole lot of money, but basically any kind of lubrication, um, any kind of body, any kind of oil that you can put into your mouth, like almond oil or coconut oil, or even canola if, you're, if canola? you don't have anything else. And I always kind of lighten things up a little and say, you know, if you've gone and spent 10 bucks on a bottle of grapeseed oil and you don't really like it, you can always 
use it to fry it, or you can make salad dressing make with salad it. Make salad dressing, hey. So, <laughs> so you know, it's not something that you're going to have way out of um, uh, pocket. But the, what I find is that men particularly find that, that oils are very sensuous, and they wonder, mm. why didn't I know this in my 30s? Because I could have really had a, a lot of fun with this. Mm -hmm. So I encourage couples, if, if they are willing to, to go to the store together, mm -hmm. find something that they really like, find a fragrance they like, because it's as much about fragrance fragrance as it is about. The aroma, you get all the senses, That's right. not just the touch, mm -hmm. but right. this, yes. And then to keep by the bedside if they can, if it, warm body oils are wonderful and just have fun playing with it. And mm -hmm. um, so. Um, are you saying that you using it as a body lotion in addition to. You can use it as a body lotion. You can also use it as a. Um, lubricant on a the lubricate penis. and on the penis and on the, on the exterior of the, of the vulva of the woman's um, sex sexual apparatus, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of women need two kinds. They need a moisturizer, they need an internal lubricant, uh, mm. particularly a woman who's not able to have any estrogen supplement as she gets older because estrogen is what supplies moisture on the inside. And mm. so if she's not, a, if she's really dry internally, she may need to get something that her physician or healthcare provider can give her. But I'm talking about things that can be used more externally. And um, mm. and men typically don't need anything internally, but they really like using oils and, mm -hmm. and having that, having the the loving um, fondling and 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 massage with that. Um, many couples, unfortunately, have never gotten into much hands-on sex. They've used their their bodies have, you know, he's gotten an erection and she's gotten ready, and they put it in, and that's been it. And they've never really experienced very much playing with each other. And erections in older age and. Sex in old age is about a hands-on experience. It takes much more, or mouth on, it takes much more stimulation to, in mm. order to get the same kind of response. And so. Because you don't uh, have those hormones you had when you were right. young. It's not, it's not like being 18 again and you can't not have an erection and you can't not get wet. It's about needing to, to help that along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The good news is that things can be wonderful and the joy of a longer time, not having anybody around, not having anybody that you have to jump up and take to, uh, to their next sports program, that's all wonderful in old age. And I would never have believed that when mm. I was 30 years younger than I am now. Mm -hmm. it, I have read that uh, the people, the, the women of India, seem to have, uh, I read something about they had a, uh, when once they re reached menopause, they felt so much more free because they didn't, weren't worried about having children and sexually felt much more free because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, know. I'm not sure it's just in India. I mean, I think that's a, that's fairly common for a lot of women. Many women find that they blossom um, after, mm. after, they are menopausal, and they would never have believed that. And, and I've talked to plenty of women who said, just tell the young folks, live long enough, and it, then it's really going to get good. <laughs> so. You had talked about uh, joyful no noise in the bedroom right. and true oral sex and don't hold your breath. And uh, actually, you can sit and talk about things before you're in the moment and find out more about things with your partner and what do you like and how can you experiment and all. Right. I, uh, holding one's breath is probably the greatest thing that goes against having a good sexual experience. And I can't tell mm. you the number of people who the only question I might ask them when they said, you know, I just can't, this just whatever, it's not working. And I'd say, well, so tell me about how you're breathing in the mm. experience. Well, I just hold my breath until it's over. Yeah, I'm just kind of like this. Well, the body <laughs> doesn't work so well when we're holding our breath. It really no. doesn't. And the body thinks I'm dying, and so mm. it doesn't go for a good sensation. So I often, the thing that I would do is teach people how to breathe, how to belly breathe, how to get their breath all the way down in their belly and then down, down into the genital organs and really concentrate on if all you have to do here is breathe. The irony is we think we have to get tense and tight and that kind of thing, but the more relaxed we can be, and this is what we have learned from India 
people in India. The yoga, from, yeah, tantric all, practice. Right, tantric practices and all of that is mm -hmm. that the more relaxed one can be in the experience, the more likely it is that the body will be able to do what you want it to do. So oftentimes women who have struggled around being able to have the sensations, um, if I can just get them to breathe, just and maybe get their hmm. mate to coach them um, into breathing, almost like Lamaze if they've done if they've hmm. been in childbirth, um, but get them to to breathe, then things get so much better. And in that. Pretty simple. Such a simple thing. It yeah. doesn't cost any more. A little canola oil, a <laughs> little breathing. Things could get a whole lot wow, better. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. And then the third thing that, that you talked about, the joy, making joyful noises. Sex is about making noise. And mm. if you're really into it, not just putting on like, like, we've seen portrayals in some movies, but truly into it, mm -hmm. you're bound to make noises. You're bound to, to, to make, to let out sounds and sometimes to let out yells. And uh, if there are other people in the household, like young children or mm. whomever, then you're not likely to do that. You're likely to kind of censor that more. So there's a freeing that comes along with not having any other spectators or any other people who might he overhear. And mm. um, I think it's very important to be able to make noises. So I call those joyful noises in the bedroom. Joyful noises, right. Uh, have the noise, don't hold your breath, just mm -hmm. breathe. Such a natural thing. Uh, and I think people just need to be reminded of that. I do. Or for uh, the first time taught of it if they never thought of it before. Mm -hmm. and just kind of being put on the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you're going to be doing uh, the second uh, version of your class at the OSHA, OSHA Vanderbilt, that's for people over 50? Well, I don't think they have an age. They oh. say for people who are interested in lifelong learning. Lifelong but learning. Traditionally, the people who have taken the courses are mm -hmm. people over 50. So I'm perfectly happy with having somebody who's 20 if they would like to take the course. I jokingly say, we have to see your ID to get in, but that's <laughs> actually just a joke. Um, the OSHER program, the OSHER Lifelong Learning Institutes are programs that are in major universities all across the United mm. States. But Vanderbilt is only the second that we know of, the second university to offer um, a course in sexuality and aging for this population. The first wow. was at the University of Delaware a year before I offered the one here. The first mm -hmm. one I offered was in 2012. And we're going to be doing one this summer in kind of a intensive um, process where we're going to talk, we're going to actually talk about, the, le the first one I did was more lecture series, we're going to have true oral sex among whoever shows up for class by sitting and talking about... With strangers, but they won't be strangers for long, well, I guess. I hope not. It's kind of difficult to talk about things that's personal if you stay a stranger. So I'm not going to be issuing paper bags for people to put over their heads. I'm going to encourage people. <laughs> I've signed up, by the way, so uh, I'll be uh, in that class. Good. good. Yes. Well, you, it, and I, I hope it'll be more than us. I, I, I've not heard what the registration is, but if it's just the two of us, we will sit and we will have dialogue like this and we will, if you want, you can ask anything. If you need me to bring pictures, if you need me to bring models, if we need to find things on the internet, we'll look at it and see because there's so much richness that folks have not learned despite the fact that we, you and I and people, people under the age of about 72 were all part of the sexual revolution. People over 72 mm -hmm. kind of were on the cusp of that. And then you have the 80 and overs who they were busy raising their families and what was the sexual revolution. So it's a whole group of people, about a 40 year span hmm. from say mid 50s to mid 90s who may be taking this. We'll see how it's gonna go. That'll be very, very interesting. Well, I noticed in your book, there were several references to now the, the everything from Viagra, Cialis, Cialis uh, and one person wrote in saying her partner, when he would take one of those drugs, he would become beet red, right. and he might as well be wearing a sign. And it's funny, after I read that, I went, oh, because I, I had one client, and it didn't even dawn on me why he was so red. And I said, are you Indian, or are you really flushed? Now I get it. I was like, oh, so that's why he was that right, way. Right. So what's up with that? Well, um, those medications, the, the, the three medications that are out now, uh, Viagra, Cialis, and... and the other one. Yeah, the other one. <laughs> I'm having a senior moment myself. <laughs> 
um, they work by dilating blood vessels. That's that's their whole the expanding the expanding, blood vessels, right. which makes they, them have a, they that's can right. have an erection. That, that's really what an erection is. An erection is blood. It's not muscle. It's not bone. It's mm. it's blood, and it's blood that flows into the penis, and is is trapped there. Mm -hmm. About eight times more blood than is normally there. But we don't yet have a drug that just goes to the penis and expands the blood vessels. And so it works throughout your whole body. And some people, particularly lighter skinned people who come from northern Euro European extraction, oh. will typically, they'll get flushed in other ways. And, and typically they'll get flushed from the, from the chest up. Uh, they also sometimes mm. get lightheaded and some people actually notice some little changes in vision. Uh, none of those are, are dangerous, but occasionally that happens. But the flush goes on. So for instance, by Viagra, which has about a four hour lifespan. Mm -hmm. So somebody uses it in the first 30 minutes to an hour and then the, for three more hours they have the medication on board so they're still flushed. The mm -hmm. erection may be gone but the rest of their body so then they go out and they're doing business and somebody <laughs> says what's going on here with this flush? <laughs> Um, and other so so sometimes what I've told people is you need to try all three of the medications because ah. one has a four hour span, one has more of it like a six hour span, the other has a thirty six hour span. Wow! And sometimes you'll get less of a flush with one than with the other one. Um, I also thought it was very interesting in your book that there um, that in the old days sexuality, the, if a male could not have a, uh, an erection, it was considered emotional. And now the sh there's a shift thinking, well, there might be a medical right. problem because right. of that. And I've seen that actually happen throughout, since I've been in the field as long mm -hmm. as I have. If you actually go back to the, the mid-70s, so I've been here almost 40 years into, mm -hmm. the, into the field. And I was taught and believed until we got into the early 90s that most everything had an emotional component. Mm -hmm. But science now has caught up and we've been able to find that there are a lot of different things that can happen. And Mostly it's blood vessel kinds of things. For instance, we know that a man, let's say in his 40s, who starts having regular losses of erection, it probably is going to be a man who's going to have angina later on. He's going to have maybe heart, heart uh, pain um, and maybe huh. heart damage because the, ves the blood vessels in the genitals are far more, s are they're smaller and they're much more sensitive to, to, to plaque formation. And so that's one of the things that we know now that that's a predictor of mm. cardiovascular disease later on. And mm -hmm. so there are some things that um, it's very clear. There are other things that we're still not quite understanding. And we're still looking for drugs, for instance, that will, that will help with ejaculation. The ejaculation problems have, there's not really medical treatment for that. We have treatment for erection problems, mm. but not for ejaculation because it's a far more complex um, entity that takes place. And huh. probably in my late lifetime, because there are many drug companies very interested in finding this, um, they will find a drug, they'll develop a drug. These are called designer drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, one interesting fact, a lot of people don't know that Viagra actually was discovered at Vanderbilt. Oh, and I did not know that. Not intentionally discovered, but during um, some clinical trials for medication to control blood pressure back in the um, 80s, what they found was that the, it wasn't doing a very good job of controlling blood pressure, but the guys were coming in saying, I want more of this, I want more of this. <laughs> I'm getting erections I haven't had before. Give me more of this. And so, <laughs> so they shut down the clinical trial because it wasn't working very well, but um, there was some communication with the Pfizer company and, they're, they're, uh, who's the, and they said, hey, maybe we need to pay attention to the side effect here. And from that then came huh. the years that developed the, um, the, 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 the drug specifically for erection problems. But I always kind of like to think that here I am at Vanderbilt, here I am in Nashville, and right over there in this research building, that's where it was all, it all got found. Wow, wow, Viagra, Vanderbilt, who knew? I know, I teach oh. the med students in the fourth year every year and I say, you can't leave Vanderbilt without knowing the Vanderbilt-Viagra connection. Do you know what it is? And I, they'll, they'll find it, they Google it and quickly can find it.
Wow. Now you speak a lot about health things for the men, and let's talk about the ladies. Okay. Uh, there is no Viagra for ladies, no, right? No, there's been attempts to try to find that, and there there were a few studies that looked like they might be promising, but the thing about it is that, that women's whole sexual makeup is much more complex than mm. men. Not to oversimplify, but mm -hmm. basically men's is an on-off sort of thing. Women's is far more like having a, 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 something that, that goes from, say, zero to 100, and you have all ranges in between, and many mm. different things that can um, have to do with that. Women are far more likely to be affected by the kind of relationship they're in, by the emotional. The emotional. Do part I like of it. you? <laughs> but there's also a physical component. So when huh. women, for instance, are not able to get wet, they don't get moisturized, and then they go ahead and have intercourse, for instance, and it's painful. Mm -hmm. Well, most women don't want to keep on doing things that are painful, and so there, it it, it that influences how things um, work out. So. What we know is that right now there's not any drug probably for women. Mm. There are, however, treatments that are being developed, some of which I don't have a lot of, I don't put a lot of credence in. For instance, mm. many women are being put on testosterone, which is the male hormone right. that all women have a little bit of, but most women don't have very much of. And the idea is, well, if it works for men, we'll give it to women. Mm -hmm. I myself and the mm -hmm. evidence shows that this is not a good idea across the board. There are people who mm. do need it and particularly an older woman who's had her ovaries removed if she's had a hysterectomy, she could might probably benefit from that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big proponent of giving testosterone to men either. There are many mm. men who are low T. Low T. That's right. the new thing on TV. Oh yeah, it's and big business. It's, oh, it's huge business. Yes. Huge business. But it's not really very safe for, for a lot of men. It's not huh. the sort of thing that a, a man ought to just be doing just because his buddy says, hey, you got low T here, and he goes and gets some testosterone. So, so I think we will see more medical advances. We're certainly beginning to understand things a lot more in a medical way and getting more scientific evidence. But I don't think we're going to see a magic pill that's going to fix women in the way that, that mm -hmm. uh, we've sort of seen that for erection mm -hmm. problems in men anyway. Wow, I see. Wow. Well, Ginger, this has been enlightening, and I could talk for hours more, and I really want to invite you back for parts three and four we'll and do five. the advanced courses. Then. The advanced courses, and of course, I personally will be taking her course next month. And then you can talk about this without <laughs> me here. And then I may bring some other classmates in. Who knows? It'll be most interesting. But Ginger Manley, thank you so much for being thank here, you. for being a guest telling us about uh, what we can do. And uh, let's not forget, uh, you can uh, see her book uh, on uh, Amazon, right? It's on Amazon, it's on Barnes & Noble. And for those of you in town, it will be in Parnassus, and it will be in the Barnes & Noble store at Vanderbilt. So. And we're going to put her uh, webpage on uh, our credits, too. So thank you again, thank Ginger. You. Thank you for Transitions. Mm -hmm.